I'm going to turn it over to Bailey. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. As Pastor, oh, I'm not used to the good morning back. <laughs> I go to a church of about 500 people, so if I were to have 500 people saying good morning to me, that would be, that would be a lot. Um, yeah, well, like Pastor Wilson said, my name is Bailey. I'm the Development Specialist at CareNet Family Resource Center in Kenosha. And thank you for having me this morning. Thank you for inviting me to share a little bit about CareNet. I know that um, Kenosha Family Church has been a longtime supporter of CareNet, and for that we are so grateful for. But for those that aren't familiar with CareNet, we are a nonprofit organization in Kenosha that provides free resources to women facing unplanned pregnancies. We offer pregnancy testing, ultrasounds, parenting and pregnancy classes, and material resources such as diapers, wipes, books, clothes, toys, all the fun, cute baby stuff. Um, our hope is to support and encourage and empower these women to choose life for their baby who are considering an abortion and walk with them throughout their pregnancy up until their child is two years old. So we, our desire is to share the gospel and to pray with them and pray that they feel God's love through us and they feel encouraged and equipped to choose life for their baby and make the best decision for them and for their baby. We've had some very exciting developments over this last year. I know that COVID unfortunately has put a lot of organizations, businesses, churches behind, but thankfully we were able to push through the COVID um, pandemic. And the first update that I wanted to give you guys is we have new executive directors. Their names are Steve and Jenna Cross. And Jenna was a board member of ours for a few years prior to becoming executive director. And when our former ED started to, she moved into the continuum of care coordinator position. And so as God was leading her towards that position, he really was working in the hearts of Steve and Jenna to step into that ED spot. So they bring an expertise, they bring a passion that I think is going to be a really great asset for CareNet. So we're excited to have them on board. Um, and also Jenna is one of our sonographers, which brings me to my next update is our sonography program has been a huge, it's, it's increased a lot lately. So we now have a new um, ultrasound machine. We have four trained sonographers plus another one being trained in October, which we're really excited to send her out for training. And this allows us to offer ultrasounds to our clients all hours of the day and all days that we are open now. So that is a huge praise for us. In the last few months, we've begun a partnership with a national organization called Human Coalition, which I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, they are experts in finding or buying keywords on Google, and they, they buy the keywords on Google, and so talk about using technology in such a positive way. So the way that it works is if I were to Google abortion near me, the pregnancy decision hotline number would show up on my phone. And so they pay to be the first spot on your Google search and they pay actually to fill up the full screen of your phone so that you don't have to continue scrolling. And so women in crisis who are, who are in that moment and they're just thinking, I, I don't know what to do, I just need to talk to somebody, I need to schedule an appointment somewhere, um, I need to figure this out, they're going to call that first number that they see on their Google search. And so in that Google search, it does say that we do not perform or refer for abortions, um, but oftentimes they're just looking for that phone number. Um, so there is a disclaimer there. Most people are thinking, oh, well, are they tricking them? No, they're not. They're not tricking them. It really, it, it is there. And then when the woman calls, she is able to talk to a trained call representative who will talk through um, just her feelings and emotions at the time and try to get her scheduled at a pregnancy center like ours near her. So all of the women that are in the Kenosha and Racine area will be scheduled 
at our clinic and the call representative actually has access to our scheduling program so they can schedule her right then and there they see okay tomorrow at 10 a.m is open are you available at that time so when she comes in we are able to verify her pregnancy through a pregnancy test and then we do an ultrasound with her and this is one of the most important parts of our ministry because the ultrasound is where we're able to show her the, the life inside of her. Um, and then after that, we walk through a decision guide with her and give her her options. Her options are abortion and talking to her about the effects of that, parenting or adoption. In, since the month of April, we have had eight women change their mind and choose life for their baby. So praise God for that. We, yeah, we're really excited. Um, Human Coalition has brought in a lot more clients and continues to do so, and we are eager to serve them. So my hope is that you're thinking now, what, how, how can I get involved? And we actually have our Run Walk for Life coming up on Saturday, September 18th. And here is a video that will give you a few more details about it. As the church, we are called to stand up for those who are voiceless. In 2018, almost 400 lives were lost in Kenosha and Racine County to abortion. That's one precious life a day lost in our communities to this human rights crisis. Over the last few months, our clinic has made huge strides in bringing in women in crisis who are contemplating abortion, and we've seen minds changed and lives saved. Now more than ever, we need you, the church, to help us stand up and fight for the pre-born and be their voice. Our goal is to empower women to choose life for their baby, to show and share the gospel with them, and see generations of families impacted through encountering our services while in a crisis season. In order to do this, we count on our donors like you to help us fund our operations and services. You can help by joining us at our Run Walk for Life on Saturday, September 18th. Last year, we raised $47,000, and this year we need to exceed that amount in order to reach more women in our area. So will you join us in participating in this event? All you have to do is raise sponsorships and show up to Library Park in Kenosha to run our walk on Saturday, September 18th. You can participate as an individual, but we highly encourage you to form a team of five to 10 people with your small group or friends and family. This is a fun and simple way to make a big impact. Once you have your team or have decided to participate individually, you can begin raising sponsorships. Our goal is for each team to raise $1,000. On the day of the event, we will have lunch, yard games, and announce the leading fundraisers after the run walk. It's a wonderful experience for the whole family and a way to connect with other believers in our city. For more information on how to get started, text LIFE to 262-204-5504 or visit carenetfamilyresources.org forward slash events. We hope you'll join us on September 18th as we aim to empower more women to choose life for their baby. So we are really looking forward to this event. This is one of our big fundraisers. We have about two big fundraisers a year. And so, yeah, we're, we're excited. And I think if Kenosha Family Church is willing to form a team and participate, you don't have to show up that day. Um, but if you'd like to raise sponsorships and um, come out that day to support us, it would, it would be great. We have the course will be a walk around Lake Michigan, or not around Lake Michigan. <laughs> that would take a long time. Um, but it'll be along the lake, and then we'll have lunch and yard games and everything. So bring your families, bring your kids, um, grandkids, nieces, nephews, whatever, whatever you would like. So... I know that um, in the past, Kenosha Family Church has also helped us run registration. So if you are interested in volunteering for the event that day and running registration, I have some forms out on the welcome table, and I will be here after the service if you want to come and stop by and ask any questions or sign up to volunteer. So thank you guys so much again for having me. Proverbs, and we're going to read some from Proverbs 8, using one of our worship Bibles, page 516. And 
uh, this is subtitled in the NIV, Wisdom's Call. And it's a kind of poetry where wisdom is kind of personified and talking to us. So, <clears throat> does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city at the entrance, she cries aloud. To you, people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple, in prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instructions instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. Uh, for wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. This is the word of the Lord. Again, I want to uh, just remind you briefly that uh, King David uh, was kind of the standard for Israel as they think about a king. And, and of course, nowadays, when people look back at Israel, uh, David kind of has the reputation of being uh, the king. And part of that, of course, comes from the idea of the prophecies that, you know, from the line of David, there'll be a new king and all of that. Uh, but David was, was pretty primary, and he did an awful lot to uh, stabilize Israel and, and uh, bring the nation uh, into um, kind of a unity that, uh, that was important and, and stabilizing it against some of the enemies uh, that, that even Saul had struggled with. Uh, and so, uh, so David was it. And having said that, I want us to... Uh, turn to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. And when we're done reading this, don't close your Bibles. We're going to move on from there. Uh, <clears throat> 1 Kings, chapter 2. And I'm just going to read verses 10 to 12. Page uh, 265, if you're using one of our worship Bibles. Then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned 40 years over Israel, seven in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his rule was firmly established. And so I talked about David because we're really going to pick up at the end of David's reign uh, and move into Solomon, David's son. Uh, who now had some big shoes to fill. Uh, his father had been king for 40 years, and uh, again, he had really brought some stabilization and all of that, and, and now uh, it's up to Solomon. And, uh, and so uh, we want to pick up the story in the next chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Using our worship Bible, it's the next page. 1 Kings 3, 1 to 3. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. Uh, so I want to stop there and talk just briefly uh, about the high places. Uh, <clears throat> the nation had, uh, had began the habit, because there was no temple, of worshiping kind of wherever they wanted to. And, and some of the most prominent places became known as high places. Uh, but one of the problems was is that some of those high places were chosen because they were literally 
high places. Uh, they were they were nice geographic places that kind of gave that sense of you know this is a good place to honor God. Uh, but previous peoples that lived there, the Canaanites, had also recognized those high places as good places to worship. And they had built altars there and things for their gods. And so Israel came in and said, oh, here's a, here's a place already established. Let's just kind of take it over. And so they did that in several places. Uh, the problem being, of course, that uh, it became um, a temptation to kind of meld in with the worship that used to take place there. Uh, and so it was kind of easy for them to fall into the trap. We're going to worship kind of God and Baal. And so they kind of struggled with that mixed religion, partly because of the high places. But at the same time, uh, God seemed to, uh, what's a good word for it, uh, condescend uh, to the people and kind of make allowance for them worshiping at the high places. We're about to see that with the way he dealt with Solomon, who was sacrificing at a high place. Um, and so it was almost like God is saying, well, the temple's yet to be built. Uh, and since it's not built, even though it's not what I had in mind for the people, uh, out of good intentions, they're trying to worship me at these high places. And so I kind of accept that worship, uh, and it works. And uh, uh, as I thought about that, it kind of reminded me, uh, you know, of our belief in what it means to be the church. Uh, and it occurred to me that um, during a global pandemic, it's kind of like not having the temple. Uh, and so you know, instead of the high places, we've gone to Zoom. Uh, and, uh, and there are still some who are watching this on YouTube later today or tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, it's almost like uh, God says, well, you know, they can't always gather the way they want to, uh, but I will accept that <coughs> spread worship. Uh, but just like the high places, there is a temptation. And uh, it's not the same as, you know, we're gonna be tempted to start worshiping Baal. But the temptation becomes, maybe I don't need to be part of a church family. Maybe watching this on YouTube is enough. Uh, and so that temptation kind of comes in. So even though God uh, you know, honored that kind of worship and the things that we had to do, um, I don't think it was his long-term plan, just as it wasn't God's long-term plan for the people to use the high places uh, back then. So a lot of stuff going on there. But let's move on to verse 4. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. And so the, the, the author here begins to, to tell us the story of one particular instance of what happened at one of those high places. So he set the stage that the high places thing is going on, and now he moves into like, in this particular case, Solomon has gone there to sacrifice at the high places. And by the way, uh, one more thing that wasn't kind of following God's instructions, um, God had established uh, a priesthood, uh, and they were supposed to be the ones to offer the sacrifices, uh, <clears throat> not the king. Uh, <clears throat> but anyways, verse 5. At Gibeon... The Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. So, God appears to Solomon in a dream. Uh, and you know, I, I heard you guys talking in Sunday school uh, outside your door uh, about uh, God talking to Abraham and, and Lot and all of that, and you know, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, that visitation was different. Uh, it wasn't a dream. Uh, there, were, there were, you know, uh, the guys. Um, and so God is working with different people different ways. Still does that today. Works with different people different ways. But in Solomon's case, he appears to him in a dream. Um, <coughs> but uh, you think about what God said to him in the dream. <laughs> Ask for whatever you want me to give to, or to give you. And I want you to just think for a moment uh, about the possibilities. Uh, imagine God coming to you last night in a dream and saying, ask me for whatever you want me to give you. Think about that for a moment. Uh, what are the possibilities? Now, suppose I said to you, ask me for whatever uh, you want me to give you. 
quite frankly, your choices are pretty limited because I just don't have that much to give. You know, oh, okay, Pastor, I want a new house. It's like, sorry, I don't have a new house. But you know, with God, there's infinite resources. Uh, if, you, if God says, ask me for anything you want me to give you, there really aren't limits on that, uh, strictly speaking. Uh, you know, you want a you want a million dollars? Well, that's easy for God. Uh, you know, you want a mansion? That's easy for God. Um, and so you've got all of these possibilities. Um, you know, I mean, some of us. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Donna would like to be out of that chair. Uh, I would like to have kidneys that work. Uh, you know, I mean, we all have these things that we could ask for, uh, <clears throat> and uh, and these endless possibilities. So, so, you know, you just think about for a moment, what would you ask for? What would come to your mind? Um, and it's almost like every time you think you've got something, uh, hey, but what, if, what, if I, what if I ask for this instead? It's even bigger and better. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like the person who gets the genie and for my first wish, I want more wishes. And, uh, it it's almost works that way in your head. We can start asking and imagining more and more and more. Um, and so Solomon had that issue. He's been told, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Let's look at uh, Solomon's response, beginning with verse 6. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him, and have given him a son to sit on the throne to this very day. Of course, he's talking about himself. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people, and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? And so given uh, all of those possibilities, <clears throat> he asks for a discerning heart. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, he, and he tells the purpose of having this discerning heart. It's to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. Uh, <clears throat> I, I want to talk more about that. Um, first of all, the idea of a discerning heart. I want to point out that that's kind of an idiom. It's one of those, uh, one of those figures of speeches that, that kind of became a term that, that had a meaning behind the literal words. And, and that shows up in the fact that different translations have translated that differently over the years, uh, starting back with the old King James, uh, where it said, an understanding heart, or the New Revised Standard Version, an understanding mind, uh, or the message, a God-hearing heart. Uh, and so those are all uh, conveying the meaning of the original language. Uh, the original language uh, in the Hebrew most literally actually says, a hearing heart. Uh, and so those other phrases are supposed to be uh, an understanding of what it meant to a Hebrew to talk about having a hearing heart. Uh, and so I want to point out three things that uh, uh, Professor, Scholar Roger Hahn uh, had to say about this. Uh, first of all, he talked about the idea of, of listening. Uh, and what that meant in this context. And I really like something he said, so I quoted it directly here this morning. Uh, he says that the request, and here we quote, tells us of Solomon's intention to listen before he spoke. To listen to God and to listen to his people. There is no greater wisdom than the decision to listen before one speaks. And so, asking for a hearing heart, uh, he was kind of asking God to help him be a good listener. And, and as Han points out, that's listening in two ways. Number one, uh, if you're going to judge between the people, you really need to hear them. 
Uh, you need to listen to what they have to say. You need to hear their side of the story. Um, you know, you, you got to hear where they're coming from, and you got to hear their evidence and all of that. Uh, but then also, you need to hear from God. <laughs> what is God saying about this? What is God's voice on the matter? And of course, besides His Spirit speaking to our hearts and minds, uh, He's already written a lot of it down. Uh, but if you don't know what's in there, you can't really use what's in there very well. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why we study the Bible and learn the Bible, because it teaches us uh, about the way God thinks uh, and what he would say about some things. So, uh, <clears throat> so Solomon was asking uh, for a hearing heart. He wanted to be a good listener. And secondly, uh, he was asking uh, I want about the, the idea of the heart and mind uh, is the title I've chosen for this point. Um, in our culture, You'll hear people talk about, you know, should I follow my head or my heart? And they might be talking about a romantic relationship or about taking one job over another and these kinds of things. And they ask the question, should I follow my head or my heart? Because we separate that in our culture. We think about the idea of the, the head uh, being where we uh, use intellect and it's uh, objective uh, and it you know, deals with data and facts and all of those kinds of things. And we think about the heart as being the seat of our emotions and, and it's, you know, kind of uh, how we feel about things. And uh, in the Hebrew mind, uh, in the Hebrew heart, it wasn't like that. Uh, the ancient Hebrews had a different way of thinking about this and describing this. And the bottom line is, is that to an ancient Hebrew, the heart was the seat of the will. Uh, it's where choices and judgments are made. Uh, and so uh, when they talk about giving you a discerning heart, uh, they were talking about uh, you know, a discerning uh, will or, or judgment. Uh, you know, uh, they weren't talking about help my feelings. Uh, they, were, they were talking about uh, help my decision-making process, uh, my, my volition or where I, uh, where I make choices. And then the third thing that Roger Hunt talks about, I have also retitled, um, I call it Roger Wilco. Who's heard that before? A few of you. Roger Wilco. Uh, that is, of course, uh, like radio language. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, it comes from us, uh, you know, I. I I take interest in these kinds of things, and I have a curious mind, so I did some research or whatever. Uh, Roger, most of us recognize that, like when you're talking on the radio, or you're watching a movie and the pilot's in the plane, uh, you know, Roger, uh, that really means, uh, I heard you, I received your message. And the way that came to us is, uh, a long time ago, telegraph operators, after getting a message, would message back the letter R for received. And then when that kind of made it over into like radio, um, they created this phonetic alphabet where they attached a word to each letter. So, uh, you know, like uh, Abel and Charlie and Oscar and Lima and Tango, you'll hear those people using those code names when they say the letters of the alphabet. Uh, well, nowadays, the, the word for R is Romeo. But it used to be that the word for R was Roger. And so that's how Roger became the word in radio that meant received. And then for Wilco, uh, you kind of divide it into two words, the, the W-I-L and the C-O. Uh, Wilco actually meant will comply. So when you say Roger Wilco, uh, you're really saying received and I will comply. That's what Roger Wilco means. And uh, I bring that up today because um, when they said it, it means I receive the message and I will obey the message. Um, that's what the Hebrew word for hear actually meant. Uh, the word hear in Hebrew, uh, in their culture, included both of those ideas. Uh, it would make it redundant. To hear was to kind of to hear and obey. So, you know, there's a difference uh, when, when, like, a mother says to her child, listen to me, or 
Why didn't you listen to me? Uh, they don't mean listen as in the sense of uh, hear the words that I said to you. They mean listen as in do what I said. Uh, that's what I mean by, you know, listen to me. Uh, and, and so that's really what is going on in Hebrew. When they talked about hearing, uh, they meant hearing and, and obeying. Uh, it was a two-way street. Um, in fact, Hebrew didn't have a separate word for obedience. Uh, if they wanted to say that she was obedient, they would say basically, she heard. Because uh, when you hear, you obey, the two are tied together. Uh, and so, uh, the idea that uh, having a discerning heart uh, is not just the feelings, but it's the mind and the judgment, the choices. Uh, it means being a good listener, uh, and it means being obedient. It means complying uh, with what we've heard. Uh, which brings me to 1 Kings 3, 10 through 13. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. <clears throat> and I'm going to, uh, one more verse. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. So he got what he asked for and more. Uh, you know, he asked for the right thing, and so God gave it to him. And then he just added on stuff. And again, you, you can't really think about getting more than you asked for uh, without also thinking about Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. So I just want to read that to you for uh, quickly here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, Paul is kind of ending up a kind of a prayer report. He's kind of reporting on what he's praying. And he ends up with, Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. That first part of verse 20, he's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. So earlier I had you ask, you know, what do you, what do you want from God? Uh, whatever you said, uh, God can give you more than that. He can give you more than you even imagined. Um, and he did so for Solomon. Uh, gave him more than he asked for. And, uh, and I want to, uh, uh, to close here pretty quick. Uh, but I want to make one more point. Uh, and I don't want us to get fooled here. Um, even a hearing heart is not foolproof. You would think that if God gave you the kind of wisdom he gave Solomon, and by the way, there's another place in Scripture that says if you like wisdom, ask God. Uh, you know, that's one of those things that he wants to give you. Uh, and so it, it's a pretty simple prayer. Uh, but it's not foolproof. The very next verse in 1 Kings 3, verse 14 and if you walk, he's still talking with Solomon, and if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Uh, and so one of the things I think that tells us is that you can be wise and you can be able to distinguish right from wrong and yet still choose wrong. Uh, you know, he's given Solomon this if statement. Uh, I'm giving you this wisdom that you asked for, uh, and as long as you stay obedient, and as long as you do right and not wrong, I'll also give you a long life. Um, because that's how free will works. Even though he had that wisdom, more wisdom than anybody had before him, 
a, a more discerning heart than anybody had after him, he was still prone to being able to choose uh, wrongly, to make bad choices. You think, how can anyone that wise make bad choices? Well, Solomon could, uh, and, and that pointed out for us. Um, and so we have to be careful uh, that we don't fall into the trap of thinking that just because we, uh, you know, we know better, uh, that doesn't mean, you know, I, I got a text yesterday from, uh, from Robin's dad who told me that, uh, <clears throat> she said, he said, Wilson, your wife has gone to my bookshelf and turned my books backwards. And uh, I, I know what was going on is uh, we've been watching some of these uh, fashion shows, you know, house design shows, and believe it or not, that's become a thing. Uh, it's supposed to be trendy and fashionable to have your books on the shelf backwards with the spines in and the bare pages out. Uh, and I have told Robin how ridiculous and stupid that is. <laughs> and so she went down there and, and you know, told her dad, oh, I'm going to help you, and, and did it to her dad. And so I told her that you know she needed punishment and all of this. Um, <laughs> but people can do that. Uh, God can give you wisdom, and, and he can help you distinguish right from wrong, and you know what's right from wrong, and then you do it anyways. And, you know, when I, I told her dad, I said, she knows better. But she did it anyways. Uh, you know, of course, she was kind of doing it as a joke. But, uh, but you, all, you all know people like that, and if we're honest with ourselves, we can probably think of times that we did it ourselves. Uh, no, I shouldn't do that. I did it anyway. Uh, you know better, but you do it. And so even if God gives you that great wisdom, uh, and so I just want to close by kind of asking you a question from earlier. Uh, and it's basically this. Do you want from God what God wants for you? So if God said to you, ask me for whatever you want me to give you, are you going to ask for something that he already wanted to give you? Or are you going to ask for something that he really doesn't want you to have? How would you answer that? That's, that's kind of something to think about for the next days to come. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word and the lessons learned there. Uh, I think, Lord, that we can all ask you this morning for a discerning heart. Uh, help us, Lord, to be good listeners. Uh, help us, Lord, to, to always be able to distinguish uh, right from wrong, uh, especially in those areas that look so gray. Uh, help us to see him correctly. And then more importantly, Lord, uh, help us to be obedient, uh, to have the courage to stand and do the right thing um, when it's hard to do the right thing. Uh, and quite frankly, Lord, when we don't want to do the right thing, uh, help us to, uh, to choose the right. And we ask, Lord, that you'd be with us as we depart in a few moments and go our separate ways for the week to serve you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. But before you go, just a few uh, quick announcements. Uh, we are doing our shopping for Shalom in August. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the cart in the back of the room. Uh, the idea is, is that for the month of August, we'll have the cart out, and you can bring in groceries uh, and the kinds of things that they're looking for. And then at the end of the month, uh, we'll deliver it to, uh, to Shalom Center. Uh, then we'll put the cart away for a couple months and uh, bring it back out in November. We're going to do it once a quarter for one month each time. So there's the pattern. Uh, again, the, uh, the items that, that, that they're really wanting or looking for is uh, on the front of the cart. Uh, it, you know, it's, uh, you can't read it from here, I'm sure. But at this page, uh, one good idea is you can go back and take a picture of it with your phone, and then you've got the list in your phone. Uh, so that's a suggestion. Uh, <clears throat> this Thursday, is uh, our third Thursday of the month, regular scheduled praise and prayer gathering. Uh, you're invited to join us here at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, <coughs> and thinking, I just said us, uh, this particular week, it's going to be join those who are here other than me, uh, because I am not going to be able to be here Thursday at that time. Uh, it just so happens that I will be picking up Robin at the airport uh, at that time. So, uh, Praise and prayer gathering for those of you who are available. 
Uh, this is also our Connect with One Another Week. Uh, we've begun an initiative to try to encourage uh, everyone to be more connected, especially since we can't always gather the way we want to. Uh, and so one week a month we kind of designate specially our Connect with One Another Week. And uh, we ask that you uh, think of somebody in the church family that you don't have regular contact with, or maybe you haven't seen in a while, uh, and connect with them. Give them a call, send them an email, send them a text message, uh, write them a card, uh, whatever is good for you, uh, that would be a way to kind of connect with them. You know, the Bible is full of uh, commands about uh, praying for one another, bear with one another, do this for one another. There's a bunch of these one another commands. And it's really hard to fulfill those if you're not connected with one another, if you don't kind of have an idea what's going on in one another's lives. So uh, connect with one another week. Uh, our uh, offering uh, box is in the back of the sanctuary, our stewardship center. If you haven't already done so, please put your offering in there before you leave. Uh, and may God bless you as you uh, go out to serve him with your discerning heart for another week. You are dismissed.